This is June 18, 1998, and I'm having a conversation with Michael Ambrosino. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. Hello, Freddie. Can you give us a little bit of your personal history, where you were born, and how, where you went to school, and how you came to television? Uh, born in Brooklyn. Uh, spent half the year there, half the year in West Hampton Beach, where Dad had another store. Uh, grew up uh, being fascinated with science and did a lot of theater music. I was a jazz musician when I was 14, had the nicest set of drums on Long Island, and because uh, the war was going on, I got Mickey gigs and played every jute mill, gin mill, and, and uh, poker palace in Long Island. Um, changed majors the first day at university. I had been admitted as a BS in physics and changed to a BS in drama because I didn't want to wake up being an old man of 35 and not having had given you know, that creative side of me a chance. And uh, it was a very romantic death wish because in those days there was one regional theater east of the Mississippi. It was called the Brattle Theater. And of course, in 1949, when I was a freshman, it <laughs> became a movie theater. So I was preparing myself for a profession that didn't exist. Uh, I, after the service, came back and did a master's in television. And uh, that was very helpful because in those days, commercial radio stations never thought they wanted to go into TV. It was 20, 30 times the capital. And at Syracuse, we produced, directed uh, a whole bunch of programs that went on the commercial stations. And as a graduate student, did a series of uh, 13 half-hour shows myself. A t tremendous kind of experience that you, you can't get today. But today, you can pick up a little camera and make a video all by yourself and edit it on your Macintosh. Uh, the second job was for the Ford Foundation, doing a uh, research project in Schenectady, New York. Uh, was one of the first high schools in the United States to use closed circuit television to expand teaching. In those days, it was a tremendous teacher shortage, and they had 27 physics classes and one physics teacher. And we were trying to multiply his use to see if we could work out technically question and answering sessions from multiple classrooms. And we did French with Madame Anne Slack, and we did social studies, and we did a bunch of things. And I was invited along with a bunch of other people from Ford cities to come to Harvard and give a speech. And somebody from WGBH heard the speech, and I was working here two weeks later. Had you heard of WGBH? Yes. While at my first job at the University of Connecticut, I had actually taken a tour of the station. I had, uh, I couldn't find it. Drove up Mass Avenue looking for a TV station, drove right past, and didn't realize that it was a defunct roller skating rink above a drugstore and uh, had to work my way all the way back from Harvard to, to finally find it. Who was the person that uh, heard your speech? Hartford Gunn. He was then the direct, he was then the controller of WGBH. He was in charge of money, um, dispersing it. We never raised money in those days. And um, he asked me to come and start school broadcasting for the state of Massachusetts. So you were in charge of developing school broadcasting for, for the station? Yeah. Based upon your experience with your in-school? Based on six months' experience, because I was an expert. I see. This was educational television. In those yes, it was. It was very educational. Uh, in those days, uh, programs consisted of series of things. It was an extension of the educational uh, system of Massachusetts. Uh, if you remember, uh, people came back from the Army, Navy, and the Marines and told Conant that Harvard should start a radio station. And Conant, being very wise, said that it'll always be a Harvard station. We shouldn't do that. And so he got Ralph Lowell to get a bunch of other institutions in Boston together. And they formed the nascent Lowell Institute Cooperative Broadcasting Council. And for the most part, they made radio series on poetry, on music, on on everything except art, I guess, is non-visual, uh, and put those on commercial stations in around town. Uh, it quickly became a real pain in the neck to get bumped off every time the commercial station really sold something, mm. 
or to be allotted Saturday morning, 7 o'clock or 6 o'clock time. And in 51, uh, the LICBC put on its own FM station. In those days, there were no FM receivers. And um, the provost, the l l later on, he became the provost of MIT, um, Jerry Wiesner, who himself had recorded for Lomax many of the recordings that were in the Library of Congress of uh, folk singers in the South, went to General Armstrong and had him give WGBH its first transmitter, which was the prototype Armstrong frequency modulation transmitter. I mean, I, I think it probably had a number one on it. LICBC, what is that? Lowell Institute Cooperative Broadcasting Council. I think every day on WGBH, David Ives talks about it. Uh, if you still turn, you know, turn the station on at 6 a.m. And what was it exactly? What, what was the function? It was a co Well, first of all, they, they charged themselves money. I mean, the major budget for the station came from Harvard, uh, MIT, uh, the Museum of Fine Arts, the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And second, from these groups uh, came programs so that uh, Edwin G. Boring would do a series on 15 programs on psychology. Uh, the Museum of Fine Arts would do programs about art. There were no children's programs in news and current affairs. It was an extension of the educational process of adult education. The Lowell Institute was created by the Lowells for those people who had uh, interest but no cash to further their education. And they could take courses at night at Harvard, and if they worked long enough, get an associate arts degree. And if you go to the Harvard commencement at any year, as I did this year, because a friend was getting a PhD, the loudest applause are for the associate arts, because they know that these people you know, work long and hard to get their degrees. When you first came to WGBH, can you kind of describe the, the place and how many people were employed there? And what, was, what was the place like? Uh, dinky. You walked in a door with two door columns on either side. And strapped to one of them was a big bronze plaque that is in the front of this building today announcing the Lowell Institute Cooperative Broadcasting Council. You went up a flight of dark green stairs, uh, turned left, and realized that there was a telephone operator next to a big telephone answering machine. Uh, it was one half of a defunct roller skating rink. Under the balcony were the radio studios and what was master control for, or control A for a studio. There was only one studio. Um, and a, a telecine room, uh, engineering offices. Above the balcony were the offices for the radio and television staff uh, and uh, audio editing for the radio producers. Uh, the floor was made of wood and one day, all the males at WGBH were invited in on a Saturday to nail the studio floor down because it squeaked. And if you panned, no, if, if you dollied a certain way, the camera just kept bumping up and down and you couldn't move. Um, there was in the other half of the roller skating rink an engineering company. And when it went out of business, it donated to WGBH three brand new galvanized garbage cans full of old breadboards. And WGBH enjoyed that so much, the engineers unsoldered every resistor from those breadboards and straightened out the prongs and put them in the proper cabinet. Um, it was a different world. It had two cameras, old tubes that had been donated from uh, commercial stations, so that if you sat anywhere very long, you burn in uh, the shot. You could do anything with two cameras that you could do with two cameras. When we got the third camera, everything was really great. On Thursday night, uh, we did a live half-hour program from the Museum of Fine Arts. All three cameras went there, which meant that any other program that night had to also originate from the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, programs consisted of 
relatively small things. I mean, it, it, it ran from something called What's Going On Around Boston, which was a drum on which were listed little three-by-four cards pinned to the drum with events coming up. And you'd play music and roll the drum and then pan left to the other card and then they would roll the drum and then you'd pan right. And this is one of the first directing jobs that you had to do. Uh, on the other hand, from the beginning days, the station did children's programming, Tony Salatan, music, um, natural history programs, Mary Lou Grimes, uh, programs that dealt with uh, world affairs, politics, uh, but for the most part, a uh, long series of programs on poetry, music, psychology, science. Science Reporter was one of the first programs, but these were interview programs, um, basically staged as, as we're doing uh, this little bit right now. Uh, not inconsequential, though. In 1955, the first mention in television that I know of, of the effect of tobacco and cigarettes on cancer, was done by a, uh, a doctor in a series called The Facts of Medicine. Um, you know, which is tremendous when you think of it. Uh, and that's, that's what it was like. How many people, Michael? I remember about 30 or 35. I remember, I, I kept thinking that I was the 35th or the 36th employee. Um, and we all had to cram into one office in the second floor. I take it money for shows was scarce and hard to come by? Uh, you didn't get money for shows. You got things. You got so many hours of studio time. You got um, whatever the scenery people could build, whatever the art department could draw. Uh, we all would rehearse our programs in the afternoon and then do them live. Um, one of the first jobs that you were taught was how to uh, replace the director of the previous live programs. Uh, there were film and kinescope and live, and that was it. And uh, with one switcher and one control room, uh, this was a juggling act. So when we started off, we were almost like radio shows being put on camera with two black and whites, and then we got a third camera, which then opened up the horizon. And all the shows were live at that particular moment. Yes, um, with the exception of those programs that had been made from other places and kinescoped and sent to us, or actual half hour or 15 minute films. But not all just discussion. I mean, the, the, the children's program was quite active. Uh, children in the studio, dancing, music, etc. The natural history program was, was quite active itself. Uh, a young Harvard senior, however, complained to Mary Leela Grimes that she had no film. And Mary Leela said, stop bitching, do something about it. <laughs> and the senior went out and bought himself an Aeroflex in 1956 for $9,000, bought lenses and designed his own lenses and shot free of charge for her for an entire year. Beavers and butterflies and all kinds of the most marvelous film. And suddenly the second year of Discovery, directed by Bob Larson, was an amazing program because it had the natural history captured, you know, instead of bringing a beaver into the studio and hoping it didn't eat up all the scenery. Um, Charlie went on to um, produce children's programs here, got his PhD, and he now is in charge of ornithology at Cornell University, which is the big job for anybody who knows anything about birds. He's a specialist in bird navigation. And his full name is? Charles Walcott. And he was either the grand-nephew or great-grand-nephew, or he had some relation to Ralph Lowell himself. So Charlie, although he had many frayed shirts, had a Mercedes and could well <laughs> afford to buy a, uh, a, uh, an Aeroflex. But he decided to do it. I mean, he's, a, he's an amazing human being. Wonderful. You started mentioning some names. I think we should go into them a little bit from your perspective. Uh, Robert Larson, Bob Larson, as we called him. Can you tell us a little bit of what he did, what, what his influence was on the station, his contribution? I, th I think he was the only 
person from Boston who worked at WGBH. He was the local boy. Uh, he'd worked at the Christian Science Monitor, came to WGBH as a producer. In 1957, when there was a major shakeout, uh, he became program manager of the station, uh, moved up uh, through the ranks uh, as program manager, became, I think, vice president when David Ives took over as president in, uh, in, in 70. Um, was a gentleman, uh, a learned man, a, uh, a person who, like many of the staff, would spend days taking courses, at, or, or attending courses at Harvard, looking for uh, good talent to be on programs, um, and uh, had a profound effect on the, uh, on the future of the station. What would you say was his most lasting? The sense that WGBH did things in an honorable manner, that ideas mattered. Uh, this is a great town for an idea. People don't laugh at you if you're serious. Mm -hmm. And it allowed many of us to do things, uh, you know, over the last 40 years that had some fun about them because they went deeply into the substantive ideas. Dave Davis. Dave Davis came uh, two or three days before I did in 1956. Uh, he'd been teaching at Temple. Uh, he had a sense of expertise because he'd worked in commercial television. And he was one of the guys like uh, yourself or Potter, <coughs> Al Potter or Russ Morash or David Atwood, who can just do anything. You know, you go into a stadium and you say, okay, we put the cameras here, there, there, get the lines, do this, and be on the air in a couple of hours. Dave had done sports and music and all kinds of stuff. Uh, he was a trumpet player and he had his own fake book, played in jazz bands, and he did a lot of the music programs. He directed the first symphonies before Bill Cassell did. Um, in the, I guess you'd call it a putsch in 1957, he was asked to take over uh, television and Bob was his program manager. And they basically were the two people who formed the station from then until 1967. Uh, they, they were the two minds that moved the station forward in terms of television. Hartford Gunn? Hartford Gunn. Probably the, the first real strategic mind in public broadcasting. Always thinking ahead. Um, the story I often use about him <coughs> in, when I'm ever giving a talk is that my first task at WGBH, in which I spent two weeks at a drafting board, was to design the University of New Hampshire television studio. Because Hartford was trying to help stations start all over New England, because he knew that GBH would never survive alone, and that public television had to become more than local, had to become regional and then national. We're talking at a time when there were 12 public stations on the air, when the closest one was Pittsburgh and the next closest was Iowa or Georgia or Austin, Houston, Texas, you know, Denver. Madison. There was none in, no station in Los Angeles, none in Washington, none in New York, you know, in which everybody, th this was, this was a, a different time of life. Hartford wanted me to, to design that so he could bring that design to the University of New Hampshire president so that if and when they ever raised enough money to put up an educational TV station, the president that week could be persuaded to excavate the cellar of a student union that was under construction <laughs> so that there would be a place that the money could, could go. I, I mean, he was thinking seven steps. I hope he played chess. I never know if he did play chess, but he had that kind of a mind whereas the rest of us would uh, possibly decry the ability of New Hampshire to set a station for itself. He was working all the angles, trying to figure out how to actually help them. And in the end, WGBH offered all of its programming live to, to WENH to help them get on the air, and they built that station in that basement, much the way it was designed. Um, there was no 
stronger strategic voice for many years than Hartford Gunn. Uh, he hired me on a ruse to be his assistant controller, but really it was to start school broadcasting for the, uh, for the state of Massachusetts. For the state of Massachusetts. Uh, but he, he knew that that was not in the cards, and so this was the, the way of either persuading Mr. Lowell or, or the then manager uh, to do it. Uh, now, Michael, I know that not only were you planning that, but you also had other responsibilities with only 35 people there to also produce and direct, correct? Tell us about some of your shows, the early shows that Michael Ambrosino did. Uh, well, we did some talk shows, uh, some that went out on radio and television simultaneously. Youth Speaks Its Mind, a weekly program in which kids would come in and talk about everything except sex, thank God, because the teachers would not want them to talk about such things as sex. Did a series called The Ends of the Earth, which was uh, Antarctic research with Father Dan Linehan, uh, who was called the Arctic Priest. He was out at the Weston Observatory in Weston. He was a seismologist. And Dan would get, Father Dan, I guess I should call him, would get uh, thousands of dollars from companies to test their equipment on the South Pole. And what he would do would be, you know, he'd, he'd get some wire from some wire company, and he would stretch out the wire, and uh, he'd work, do his seismology, and uh, three months, or when his time was up, he'd come look for the wire, bend it to see if it was okay, <laughs> and write a report to the company, and that money could pay for his seismological work. Uh, one day, he f did not find the wire. All he found was a ball of copper. It seems that the school of gulls had eaten oh whatever God. neoprene lining was on the wire. And he reported that it was very true, it was very flexible <laughs> after a month in the Arctic, but that they should find some less palatable substance to put around the wire. Uh, we, did some, we did a lot of plays. A uh, wonderful woman named Adele Thane. Mm -hmm. Um, who is probably now known as the person who taught Julie Taymor mm -hmm. of Lion King fame, uh, how to be a good child actress. Uh, she ran the Boston Children's Theater, and uh, every time they would do a play, Adele and I would adapt it for television and bring it in uh, and do a half-hour version of Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn and, and a variety of things. Um, uh, and some of those guys are in Hollywood, Michael Tiger, uh, you know, so in those days you could do whatever you want as long as you didn't spend money. I mean, you, you were doing plays by Brecht uh, as, as long as you could get volunteers and paint the sets yourself and, and do all that other stuff. It, it was a different world. People said, you know, wasn't it the golden times? And the answer is no. I've been poor and I've been rich. <laughs> and let me tell you, <laughs> I prefer having money to do research and, and proper television and film technique. The, you also did a lot of science shows even in the early days, didn't you, Michael? Uh, when school broadcasting started. Uh, when was that? Uh, that was in March the 4th, 1958. It took us I had to make a couple hundred speeches and persuade uh, about 35 school systems to voluntarily contribute money. And uh, we did a series with Gene Nichols called Science Six. Um, Gene music Gray. I'm sorry, right, Gene Gray, Gene Nichols directed. Um, we did a music program with Tony Salatin, a social studies program, and a French program with Anne Slant. Uh, that was the first year. And then we, we hired a larger staff and did programs that were complementary to the curriculum uh, to the schools, broadcasting to uh, a significantly enlarged number of schools each year. I think when I left in 1960, there were 135 school systems that had voluntarily come together. Uh, that system is no more. It's now called Massachusetts um, educational television, and they do satellite programs with their own facilities. They don't do that in cooperation with GBH anymore. A major event took place at WGBH when videotape arrived. Can you kind of tell us what, what, what was the difference at WGBH from the live black and white broadcast to that of when videotape arrived? Not much. <laughs> Uh, Hartford Gunn went, you know, would go to all the national meetings, and he came back from an NAB meeting, and he said, 
to us all two things. I have seen the future and it is videotaped. And the second thing is he said, buy Ampex. <laughs> you know, he was paying us our salaries, our public broadcasting salaries. None of us could buy Ampex <laughs> except Henry Morgan. And he bought Ampex. Um, basically, tape meant that instead of rehearsing six or seven programs in an afternoon and doing six or seven programs in an evening, you would rehearse a program in the morning and tape it and rehearse a program in the afternoon and tape it. And that evening, there would be some live programs and some pre-taped programs. All school broadcast programs were pre-taped. Um, and um, it allowed repeats. Uh, the word editing was not something that we knew about. You made a half-hour program, and you shot it all the way through. And if there was a glitch, you had to live with it. Uh, even much later, uh, there was no such thing as, you know, as we're doing. Um, I'm talking about, I guess, 58, 59. Hartford had persuaded someone to give WGBH its first Ampex. And he was, you know, always the crusader and then demanded that public television or educational television in those days get off the kinescope routine and make videotape programs because the quality was so significantly better. Uh, the Ford Foundation finally was persuaded to give all public television stations not already equipped a videotape recorder. And Hartford screamed bloody murder <laughs> and eventually won and so WGBH was the first station that had two videotape recorders. Uh, both of them were uh, badly hit by the famous fire. Mm -hmm. I do remember one show in which you were doing a science show and Jean Grey was taking some hydrochloric acid, I believe. Maybe you might recall that. Cause no, that's it, still it, on it, it, wasn't, it wasn't Jean Grey. It was Norman Senior Moment. Um, it was the science, the chief scientist at the Museum of Science, who he was doing the program with, spilled uh, acid on himself. Oh, it wasn't that. I was thinking about there was a styrofoam cup. Oh, 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 no, that was, that was not a acid. I think that was uh, carbon tetrachloride. Carbon tetra Why don't you give us a little background of oh. that? Because that exists on tape. Oh, it does? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Uh, cut it in. <laughs> yes. Uh, Gene was pouring carbon tetrachloride in a styrofoam cup that was on a scale to do some very special weighing, um, not knowing, obviously, that carbon tetrachloride dissolved <laughs> styrofoam cups, and it just all, you know, started... In a live show. <laughs> yes, in a live show. <laughs> Spill all over the place. Um, but, li you know, I mean, the, the famous stories of live television were there. Mary Leela Grimes did let some bats loose in her 5.30 children's program. They were still flying around the studio at 6.30 when Louis Lyons was doing his news program, and they were going in and out of the shot. Um, we just did things like that. I mean, things fell down, or cameras fell over, or you, you heard strange noises, and uh, you just went right ahead. You want to recall the jingling, Johnny, for me? Uh, you, you know the Jingling Johnny story better than I. Uh, <laughs> you were doing a music show. Yes. And I think it was a, it was a school show. It was about various instruments of various 13 kinds. Programs. Thirteen one programs. One included a symphonic orchestra. And, right. And uh, your stage manager was? Uh, John Henning, who's now the newsman, senior newsman at WG, uh, WBZ. And, uh, and I instructed John to hand in the Jingling Johnny quietly. This, this is a, a brass pole with about 9,000 bells on it that jingled. It was a, you know, an, an ancient instrument. We were doing a program on ancient instruments with the, uh, the Museum of Fine Arts instruments. Uh, something called a, um, I forget that, uh, <laughs> the serpent a very deep bass horn. Uh, at the rehearsal several nights before, someone was tightening a lute of a 14th century uh, instrument, uh, tightening the strings of a 14th century lute, and the back broke in two. <laughs> I'm just glad that didn't happen on camera. Um, it wasn't that you were 
particularly attuned to things going awry, but you knew that they would, and, and you dealt with them, just like Johnny Carson does, and, and all of the live talk shows do now. Do you remember the famous incident at the MFA when the scoop was placed a little bit too closely to the... Well, WGBH had done previous research, quite literally, to see how much light would destroy a painting. And uh, I think some fakes and maybe even some paintings of uh, lesser known artists we use for these tests. Because, you know, we were talking about uh, three and four hundred foot candles, and then when color came in, it was five, six, seven hundred foot candles to get a, to get a shot. Uh, and uh, the paint would just slowly drip off the canvas. Mm, I think it was a Renoir. Yeah, uh, was it was a Renoir. <laughs> also, no, I don't remember that. I do remember, because the cameras had relatively long single lenses, the camera sort of panning across and hit a priceless Egyptian um, statue, which ended up as a bunch of sandstone on the studio floor. Yes, the MFA had a department of television for a while. I think that yes. ceased to exist. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did, they did, you know, many wonderful programs. They'd, they'd bring a whole bunch of uh, art into a studio and a variety of different um, MFA people, producer, writer, direct, uh, producer, writer talent would do uh, the Age of Cezanne or Van Gogh's early days and use all of the paintings to illustrate these things. My favorite story was Brian O'Doherty, who was one of the very first of the, uh, of the on-camera hosts, and actually in many ways public television's first star because it was his kinescopes that got shown on many stations. Well, he would have everything that he had to say on little pieces of paper hidden everywhere oh. <laughs> with inside the museum <coughs> behind us. So as he walked from one to the next, his eyes would scan yeah. <laughs> to read the next section. And of course, those were all live. And another thing that's not known, that the MFA is totally wired for television. Yeah. Not, uh, not a lot of people know uh, that. The Museum of Fine Arts was wired for television. Kresge Auditorium right. in back of WGBH was wired for television. And um, Sanders Theater was wired for television and had a microwave dish in its tower, which burned down, <coughs> I think, two nights after I came to WGBH. Uh, so that we used to use these as adjunct studios. Right. Well, there was, there was no place big enough to do a symphony orchestra, so the first time I used a symphony orchestra, I put it in Kresge and had Dave Davis direct for me that day. Um, so we had a Studio A, and then when this other company went out, there was actually a Studio B. A uh, Studio B. And then we had a bus which had the remote equipment in it. That right? was rather late in our life. That was yeah. in 1961. It was a million mile Greyhound bus that, mm -hmm. you know, new brakes, new tires, and they were equipping it. Uh, they put the cameras in on, I think, a Tuesday and put the two tape recorders in on a Wednesday, and I think Thursday we burned to the ground. Yes. October the 14th, 1961. They, I have charred papers in my uh, archive file at home. Where were you? I was in Chicago. I was giving a speech for the Ford Foundation. And uh, you may not remember, but in those days, every year or so, there were national air alerts in which all flights would be suspended for 24 hours. No, I forgot about that. Yeah. And the Air Force would play war games. So I got a call from Dave Davis saying we'd burn to the ground. And this is about 11 o'clock, and at about 12 o'clock, uh, the air alert went on. For the, I had to sit for 24 hours in Chicago without being able to get home, worried to death uh, whether or not the tapes from the 21-inch classroom had uh, been saved or not. And indeed, they had. They were thrown out of the window by Bob Moscone and were mm -hmm. caught by firemen and volunteers. Mm -hmm. And um, at least we could go on the air with school broadcasting. Before we go beyond the fire, I'd like to go back to the other. What was the atmosphere like at WGBH in those days, in, before the fire? I mean, what would you say? Would, uh, the 35, which probably grew to, what, 75 by the time the fire happened? 50. 50, <laughs> 50, yeah. 50 60, maybe. Um, I think we thought we were doing pioneering work. I think we thought we were doing God's work. I think we were, you know, nobody was watching us, but by God, we were doing good work. We were trying very hard. Uh, 
most of us had backgrounds that thought ideas were fun, that got, you know, I, I think most of us would rather attend a good lecture than a bad movie. And uh, maybe we were a little smug that the rest of the world would think that was fun too, because what we were basically doing was presenting lectures on television and radio. Um, we were trying to advance the medium, but uh, we had such damn few aids to help us. I mean, the equipment was old and outmoded. The, the, uh, we were bound into the studio. You could do anything you want as long as you brought it to the studio. Gardening programs were done with a huge vat of, of, um, of uh, dirt. And, you know, uh, you would plant in that. Uh, and then you'd have to clean the studio. You'd have to make sure that you didn't make it up because there was a program coming later and the, the dirt would have to be picked up. Um, it was a nice place to be. Um, we all would eat lunch together. Um, I had one of the few cars, so we'd all pile in and go swimming in the North Shore. Um, after a while, I stopped and invited everybody except for one person. <laughs> uh, Do you mean there was a significant other in the early days uh, of WGB? Lillian Akel was a marvelous junior petite to former journalist who was working as a radio producer at the station. And when I reorganized the the uh, office plan, I accidentally put her desk next to mine. And uh, we and many people at the station uh, did a lot of things together, and we became fast friends. And the next thing you know, you know we became uh, man and wife. Terrific. That's a happy story. Yes, it is. We had uh, almost 40 wonderful years. I remember that uh, it was sometimes hard to tell the difference between work and play in the early days of WGBH. It's interesting because I've been, uh, after Lillian died, I went through a lot of her diaries. And uh, we were here on Saturdays and Sundays. We would be doing desk work and editing and rehearsing and doing all kinds of things. It, uh, we were all, you know, for the most part single and we had no children and we had nowhere else, where else to go and we just were here. Uh, most of us lived fairly close by. Uh, we lived in Marlborough Street. We just sort of walk across uh, the river and be here uh, for the most part. There were some uh, interesting people that wandered through WGBH at that time, Bob Squire being one of them. Maybe you can give us a little history of Mr. Squire. Uh, Bob was a torrent. Uh, he was a BU scholar, uh, produced and directed, uh, stayed on uh, after that, did some programs, uh, did some consulting in Saudi Arabia, was it? Mm -hmm. Uh, came back and did programs here. Um, he's now, you know, one of the country's best political uh, consultants. Um, you know, just a torrent. He just, he moved very quickly then. Uh, added a certain kind of significance to the uh, editorial staff of uh, WGBH. I remember he was the one that really established the snapping oh, the of snap the fingers. Of the snapping yeah. of the fingers. Uh, somebody else who had an impact, I think, in the directing part was Paul Noble. Yes, Paul did a lot of uh, the um, Mrs. Roosevelt programs, did all of them with Henry Morgenthau. Um, the, uh, Paul was also part of the BU Scholars, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah. In, in those days, the crew, the, the people who ran camera and did the lights and stage managed, uh, were graduate students at BU who were on a two-year rather than a one-year program. They'd school a semester and come work for us a semester. And then, so there were two groups. And those who schooled would then be replaced. And that lasted uh, a number of years until the, the complexity of the programs just made it necessary for us to have you know, full-time people uh, so that we weren't teaching them camera work while we were trying to do very complicated programs. Um, and that's when we went to a, to a full crew. And then a second crew, and I remember uh, possibilities of a third crew, because everything was studio-based, film. WGBH was doing a film project in the earliest days, and uh, the first one was an absolute disaster in 1957. Because, except for Paul Rader, who was brought in to do the project, uh, all of us grew up in live uh, 
TV terms. And we knew that you did all your research and you did all your work and you got it and you did it Thursday night and it, it either went on tape or it went out. But film you could always play with a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and you could never finish. And GBH got a contract, in hindsight, a, a very silly contract, to make programs about existing scientific projects going on around the world in the International Geophysical Year, 1957. You can't make a film about something that's going on because what happens is you go out uh, with a group of scientists <coughs> into the ocean and you watch them drop things into the ocean. And that's exciting. And then you watch them look at dials. And that's very exciting. And then they say to you, uh, we won't know what the results were for about another six months. If you can come back and interview us then, you know, we can tell you mm -hmm. some more. And so WGBH had uh, been given money for three programs, had finished one, and the other two were in relative shambles. The money came for the second three, and Hartford wisely at that point said, uh, we really don't know the film business and had a meeting with the entire film staff. And this was the first time that I've come across a situation in which honorable people can leave a meeting thinking that two different things occurred. The head of the film department and his assistant came out and said to Jack Hurley, Hartford's such a thoughtful man. He's so concerned about our problems. He really appreciates the trouble we're having. And Jack Hurley had to say to them, excuse me, don't you realize that you've just been fired? The film department is being closed. The money is being given back to the National Science Foundation. And this place will never do another film. And that's not the, s the story they took out of the meeting. Uh, it, it really was a rush of money. And this building that we're sitting in was built without any film facilities in it at all. Because we didn't know film. And it was a long time before we did film again. We snuck it in. We snuck it in. <laughs> <laughs> um, from, if there was one moment out of that early period before the fire, which really kind of sticks in your mind as being one of the happier moments for you, be at work or, you know, and, and not Lillian, obviously, but, you know, is there one kind of moment that really kind of said to you, this is why I got involved in television in the first place? Well, I was doing, it was uh, during one of these programs, music for grade six, I was directing myself, and the folk dancers were late. And I couldn't understand why they were late. And they finally all arrived. And they told me that they had met the nicest man on the steps of MIT and folk danced with him for 20 or 30 minutes. And when they described him, it was clear that this was the world's leading mathematician at the time who frequented the steps of MIT and the soda joint downstairs. And I'm blanking on his name. Norbert Wiener. Norbert Wiener. Uh, who lived in Belmont, I guess, with his mother and... Lived in another world. Yeah, <laughs> lived in another world and was folk dancing with my students. Um, uh, there was also the time... <coughs> uh, well, there, there were... I guess that would be one of the, one of the, the joyful things, is that we were, we were doing things with our hands. We were involved in everything that we did. We, produced, directed, wrote, whatever we did. We um, built the scenery, uh, determined where the, you know, the basic lighting patterns uh, would be. Uh, it was in our hands. It was not as much fun as I think we all came to do later when we actually had uh, huge resources at our command. And then we're working up to the level of our incompetency, uh, where we were not curtailed by outside influences but only our own knowledge, creativity, and, and persistence. Was there one major disappointment in those early years that you wished you could have changed or something that could have happened that would have made everything? Not in those. That came later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the fire. 
WGBH and Boston kind of got married pretty tight together, didn't they, at the time of the fire? Uh, because we went off the air, but we were on the air very shortly after that. Maybe you might kind of recall, after you returned from Chicago, what you found, what was going on in Boston as GBH had been burned to the ground. Well, I walked up those stairs into my office, and I suddenly realized... This is at 84 Mass this Avenue, is at 80, after the fire. Yeah, 84 Mass Avenue. I suddenly realized... I was not walking on the floor of my office. I was walking on what was left of the ceiling. The roof of the station had collapsed. I, uh, with a shovel, dug away enough stuff to find what was left of my desk. The telephone had melted over a uncanceled check that had come in. Um, Good gracious, uh, for, you know, for, for school broadcasting, 61, no, ex for the Eastern Educational Network that we were creating at the time. Uh, I had left WGBH and was uh, the founding director of the Eastern Educational Direct Network with offices at WGBH. I had in the back of my office a huge oak table that had been built into the wall. It was the former dressing green room table, yeah. and it had charred underneath, and the water hit it, and it bent over. And as I lifted it up, that portion was attached to the wall. The entire wall of my office fell into what was the remaining of Studio, Studio B. A. And I thought, I'd better back up and get the hell out of here. Uh, there were a few documents, but everything, all of the research that I had um, amassed on school broadcasting. All of the work that we had uh, put together in developing the Eastern Educational Network was gone. And the first thing I did was to sit down and try to reconstitute my telephone list because I had to call foundations mm -hmm. and stations and tell them that we were still in business, that the development of the network would go ahead. Two days after the fire, Hartford Gunn and I left Boston and drove to Maine to testify before the legislature of Maine as to whether or not they should start educational television. And coming from a station whose fire had been in the front pages of every Maine paper, we had to tell them that we were still in business. Uh, the third day after the fire, I, I uh, flew to Washington, D.C to do the same thing to uh, government agencies that we were looking uh, for grants. Uh, but it was basically, uh, we all survived. We are the station, the human beings involved. Uh, we'll be back in business. Uh, and we were fairly soon in seven different locations uh, around Boston. Uh, the live TV studio, a live TV studio, was at the Museum of Science. You paid a quarter and watched the animals make television. Uh, the Roman Catholic television center. center with a little studio with a chandelier in the middle so that if you pulled back too far, <laughs> the chandelier came in every shot. Right. Um, the scenery was built for us at Northeastern University. Right. There was what was called the Red Shack or the Red mm -hmm. Building Seen. at the Museum of Science where there was a staff. Uh, Kendall Management Square. was in Kendall Square in the Eastern Educational Network. We moved the headquarters there. Headquarters of the Eastern Educational Network <laughs> was two desks, <laughs> two, two 1930s-style uh, desks given to us by the Christian Science Monitor. Um, I think the Christian Science Monitor took every piece of old furniture they had. I think this looks like some of it. <laughs> and gave it to us, and that's what we used. Uh, old Underwood typewriters, et cetera. And we survived like that, immediately started designing a place to see, to, to use for fundraising. Uh, that design never got built, but later a group went up to Dartmouth and really designed this place. Uh, this place, I think, was designed with nine or ten live TV studios, not one film editing room, because the whole idea of live TV and needing many places to make it was still very much in our minds. 
That soon changed, though, and ended up, I think, with three studios. Studio A, Studio B, and Little Studio C. A Little Studio C, which was a radio studio that parroted the studio we had at 84 Mass Avenue, a radio studio with glass sides in certain places so that Louis Lines and the News could come out of there and we could shoot through the glass. Um, we were on the air very shortly after the fire. Yes. Broadcasting. Uh, I think school broadcasting went on the next Monday. TV was off for maybe a night or two. Uh, the Junior League of Boston marshaled every woman with a car. Uh, Dave Davis got every commercial station in town, both of them. This was 61. Maybe there were three. There were three. There were three. Channel 5 had gone on the air. And the engineers ran, uh, brought the schedule of when they needed their own tape recorders for their own programs. And school broadcasting went on the air with tapes being shuttled from station to station to station where a tape recorder was available at 8.30, at 9, at 9.30, at 10, etc. Um, and Dave Davis organized all of that. And sometimes, you know, tapes would have to be transferred back two and three times. Uh, the stations were, were wonderful. Uh, an immediate cry went up as to uh, how we could, we would need a million or so dollars to put GBH back on the air. Um, it's, it's necessary to talk about Ralph Lowell, because I think his beautiful picture down in Connors uh, makes us think of him as a, uh, a nice, cuddly man who, you know, was, had the money, and that's what he gave to GBH. Uh, Ralph Lowell had guts. And I remember on many occasions when WGBH was about to risk editorially or with cash. And it was Ralph Lowell who always gave the support to Hartford to do it. Um, many of us have been in many positions where we've had boards of directors or presidents of corporations over us. And it is not inconsiderable to have somebody who stands behind you and says, yeah, do it. You know, you've presented the case well. Go ahead and do it. And that's what Ralph gave to the station. Second, he had command of the names and the bodies of this town, so that if he asked you to do something, it was hard to say no. He had that much respect. Um, and it was more than just raising money. It was ideas and, uh, and people. Uh, significant guy. I remember uh, for a period of time, I was uh, one of the BU scholars that was asked to go down to his bank on payday because uh, Jack Hurley, who was then head of finance, was having trouble making the payroll. And uh, Daddy Lowell, as we called him, <coughs> always able to come forward to make sure that we all got paid. <laughs> well, we had a, you know, we had a, um, a drawing account at, at the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, on the second day I was at WGBH in 1956, I too was asked to present myself to Ralph Lowell. I had at the same time been reading John Marquand's book, and I forget the title of it now, but it was about, you know, a Lowell type person. And he described how you walk in the bank and there was all the marble and then there were the people behind the cages and then there were be people behind the balustrade and some of them had desks and some didn't and some had desks on rugs and some didn't and then some had offices and then there was the office. And I walked into the Boston Safe Deposit and Trust Company and I saw John P. Marquand's bank. <laughs> and I was ushered in to meet the Mr. Lowell in the office as he had so described. And I, I'm, I'm certain he had known Ralph Lowell and had been to the bank many times. <laughs> is there anybody else that was as, as significant to the you know, GBH and who it is now as, in those days? Dozens of people at the universities. Okay. I mean, the people who gave of their time. Um, the, symf the Boston Symphony Orchestra, uh, uh, Ralph Lowell, who sat down and had a meeting with Petrillo and got us uh, the permission to do the Boston Symphony Orchestra live. Uh, 
and if any money ever came about, it would go to the pension funds, but we never paid them a penny to do concerts. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the idea of a live TV concert uh, of a, an entire symphony uh, was just unknown in those days. Um, the history that exists on those tapes downstairs in archives is quite amazing. Yeah, Charles Munch and... Uh, Leinsdorf. Leinsdorf. Uh, I remember we did concerts by, you know, one of the last concerts that Stravinsky came and conducted himself. Um, no, it is a history. MIT science reporter, just as we end off this hour, maybe you should give us just a little bit more history of that since... It, it was, a, uh, it was a, st a studio program that was basically uh, a lot of talk and a little showing, and then it became a little talk and a lot of showing. Um, it then found uh, resourcefulness in a man named Russ Morash, in which it became a lot of showing and on the road um, so that you didn't have to bring things into the studio. Uh, it started out with uh, Voltatori as the MIT on-camera host, and then John Fitch did that. And I think those programs were instrumental in, in reminding us that the studio was out there in the world. And uh, Russ and Al Potter and uh, Pete, Downey. Pete Downey just took us everywhere uh, that we could move. It was one of the first programs that I distributed to the rest of the stations as the founding director of the Eastern Educational Network. And it was one of the proofs we used that uh, programs that we made locally could be distributed by our network by videotape because we were not interconnected in those days, and that the Eastern Educational Network had a, uh, a useful thing to do in addition to the, the national network, um, which didn't want Science Reporter at the time, and later, of course, picked it up and it became a big national show. <laughs>